respond. Today we're looking at responses that don't work. So the the reality we have the reality of being in exile, which is being disconnected from the vertical. Um, therefore, our reason is not guided by revelation, and then being disconnected from the horizontal, so that we now begin living for ourselves and not serving community. And then we're disconnected from nature, from the surround, and we make nature bend to our will and not we conforming to, to nature. The end result, of course, is um, our relationships become um, fragmented, our identities become fragile, our um, relationships become transactional, our sources of fulfillment do not fulfill us. Now, when living in exile, as it is in that case, today I want to look at what responses don't work. There are ways we can respond to the reality of being in exile. And we will consider two passages of scripture. So we'll begin with known, then we will go to the unknown. And we will recap a few things we read from Daniel, um, the story we're basing it on the book, the Bible book of Daniel. And so I'd like to invite us to consider again, Daniel chapter one, reading um, selected verses, selected passages, whoa. Um, from Daniel chapter one, verse one. And then thereafter, not too long, we will go to um, a few more passages in the book of Jeremiah. So let's begin off by finding Daniel, and then we will be able to follow it up with the book of um, Jeremiah. So Daniel, I'm reading chapter one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Jerusalem, and he besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, and he carried them into the land of China to the house of his gods, and he brought the vessels um, into the treasure house of his God. And the king spoke unto Ashpenaz, the master of his um, eunuchs, and he said, he should bring certain of the children of Israel, even of the seed royal and of the nobles, youths in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and endured with knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability um, to stand in the king's palace. That means to serve in the king's palace and that he should teach them the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans, the, sorry, the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed um, for them a daily portion of the king's um, meat and for the and of the wine which he drank, and that they should um, be nourished for three years, and at the end they should stand before the king. Now, among the three, there were three children of Judah. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and the prince of the eunuchs gave unto them names unto Daniel, he gave the name Belteshazzar, and unto Hananiah, Shadrach, and unto Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Then the popular verse, verse 8 says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God made Daniel to find kindness and compassion in the sight of the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear for my king, because why should he see you with poor countenance? Then now go with me. We, we read much of that story yesterday. So go with me to the last two verses. That's verse 30 and verse 31, it says, um, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding concerning which the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times. Who is them here? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. He found them 10 times um, wiser than the king's um, enchanters and the king's wise men. And Daniel continued even until the first year 
of King Cyrus. Brilliant. So how do we, how do we respond to the reality of being in exile? Um, we already are seeing a few responses there. But let me begin by asking, when you read the story, something very interesting pops out is when, when Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, get some of the um, nobles and of the princes from Judah, it's hard for me to accept or believe that the only four princes, that Daniel and um, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah were the only four individuals, they definitely were more. But somehow we, we don't know the names of the rest or they're not brought to prominence. And then certainly when you read verse eight, the decision to be different was made by Daniel and then his three friends with him. So it's only of the many nobles and of the many angels who ticked the box from Jews who are in exile, who are brought in into the program it is only Daniel and the other three who end up being mentioned. So one thing is notable, Daniel stands out for his faith and with him, his friends, Daniel speaks out for his, um, and he engages. But there's this whole unnamed and unnumbered multitude that does what quite a number of people um, living in exile, quite a number of Christian believers operating within the prisons of exile end up doing, and that is they end up withdrawing completely from the culture. They, we, we, they go completely incognito. They withdraw absolutely and withdraw completely um, from the culture. We'll come to that shortly. But then we see another response which is the response of them becoming so assimilated, so consumed by the culture that there's nothing outstanding about them. There's nothing different about them. Or to borrow very heavily Bible, biblical language, they are neither salt, neither are they light. They become completely assimilated. They, align very closely with the ideas, with the theories, with the practices of the culture until they become altogether assimilated. We remember the three Hebrew boys and Daniel because they stood out, they were different. We do not remember any of the other Hebrew boys or men who were brought in into the service because they ended up being assimilated. The Hebrew boys were given Babylonian names, but they still maintained a Jewish character and a Jewish belief system. And as a result, when they were done with their three years of training, they had something different to offer. They had something unique to give and they were found to be 10 times better. Part of the reason the other assimilated Jews had nothing unique to offer is because all they had to offer was that which they had received from Babylon. They were basically echoing back to Babylon what Babylon had given to them. And with that, there's nothing outstanding about them. But with Daniel and company, Daniel and his three friends, there's something different about them because, yes, they were given new names, yes, they were trained in the language of the Chaldeans. Yes, they were trained in the learning of the Chaldeans, but they had something, they engaged with the culture, but they were not assimilated by it. They were able to keep their distinctivisms without necessarily sticking out as a saw, unnecessarily so as a saw thumb. And at the end of the day, one of the things that qualified them to not only stand, that is to serve before the king, but to serve in very unique positions is they were not just products of the culture. They brought in something that the culture could not have. They were not assimilated. But before we go any more into Daniel and company, let's just think about these unnamed individuals who had potential. When you look at the selection criteria, 
you needed to be good looking, you needed to be brilliant, you needed to be able to have scientific acumen, you needed to be able to have talent and ability. So the rest of the unnamed people are not omitted from the rest of the narrative because of a lack of ability. They are actually el el eliminated from the rest of the narrative because they have become assimilated. Now, this, this particular section of the narrative is something, if you've listened to any other Christian sermon about the experience of Daniel in captivity, you've probably heard about this, you know, like dare to be a Daniel, stand out to be different and everything, but we have two more other responses. And so I want to ask, have you been assimilated by the culture? Have you been assimilated entirely by, um, the entire exile experience. Are you able to be salt and light? That's if you're a Christian, or there's really no difference. The culture sees nothing different. The exile sees nothing different in you because all you have is all it gave you. Your ideology, your value system, your judgment um, basis, the source of hope, where you get satisfaction, where you generate meaning, are not any different from that which is inadequately provided for by the exile system. And so there's nothing outstanding. You see, when Jesus says we need to be salt of the earth, you add salt to food because salt has certain properties not present in the food and therefore the food requires the salt we don't food the salt we salt the food when jesus says you're the light of the world a city built on the hill it's because contrast is the mother of clarity and so the city built on the hill being lit has light which the surrounding environment which is in darkness cannot a generate and B, it needs. And therefore, the value of the city on the hill that is lit comes from the idea that they have something that the surrounding or resident culture or society both requires but cannot generate. And if the city therefore becomes assimilated into its surrounding darkness, the city cannot be able to give anything. One more point to say on this before I move is this. Exile allows us to access a lot of things. In our digital times, our exile experience allows us at the click of the button to access ideas, access people, access places, access experiences, which we otherwise would not have ordinarily obtained in our own home ground, in our own value system. But if we are not good stewards of the access which exile gives us, the access, instead of becoming a source of blessing, becomes the conduit through which we end up being absorbed completely wholesale into the culture. The reason the other unnamed Jews become absorbed is because they were unable to be good stewards of the access that they had, the access to knowledge, the access to learning, the access to food, the access to networks, the access to a new culture. They either did not have the tools or were not able to um, properly leverage their tools from back home. And as an end result, the access they had within Babylon became the thing that led them to be assimilated within Babylon. And as an end result, instead of them being light and salt, they were just forgotten and absorbed in. And so I ask you in love, are you responding number one with assimilation? How are you handling all the various privileges and information and competing ideas and various individuals that the 
exile culture is allowing you to come into contact with? Do you have the tools of true stewardship to be able to know how to sift between the ideas and the individuals and to know what to bring in into the foundation of your life or are you just consuming it wholesale? Are you so eager to closely align yourself with the culture of exile for whatever reason, for acceptability or to gain upward mobility or to not just stick out, that rather than using the access you have to help you impact the culture, you're using the access you have to assimilate you into the culture as it were. Response number two. So response number one is the response of access. For response number two, I need to give a bit of historical context before I read it. The captivity of the children of Israel um, being taken from Judah into Babylon did not happen once. What the Babylonians did under Nebuchadnezzar is they had military campaigns. And in the first military campaign, they took... Um, some people captive and they took some of the temple um, goods and brought them to, to Babylon. And then a few years later, I think three or four years later, um, they came back again. And that should have been around 597 um, BC. The first one happened around 605 BC. They came back again and took in more people. And this time around, they destroyed the entire city. So the exile was not one campaign. It was several campaigns. That's just the important piece to learn. Then second thing to know historically is because of the nature of the way the campaigns happened, there was still people who remained back in Judah. There was a king who was left in Judah, although he was more or less like a puppet king. There were prophets who were in Judah, and specifically there was a prophet like Jeremiah was still in Judah when some of the people were in captivity. You'll want to note that prophet Ezekiel is carried away into captivity. So when Daniel is in the palace as a prophet and serving there, Ezekiel is a prophet, but he's also in captivity. He's also in Babylon. And Jeremiah is back in Judah he is the one whom God has appointed to be with the people who've remained to still try and preach to them. On a side note, let me say this way. Imagine you are a church who had at one time, as your pastors, you had Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel at the same time. It's not an embarrassment of talent. It probably speaks to the dire state of your need. That God has to unleash this amount of talent on you, it really means that probably something is really, really wrong as it was with the children of Judah. Now, when you understand that, you will need to understand that there were false messages going back and forth between the people who remained in Judah and the messages that were being sent by some people from there to the people who are in captivity in Babylon. Now, with that amount of context in place, I would like to invite you to consider some passages in Jeremiah 28, Jeremiah chapter 28, and then we will read some other passages in Jeremiah chapter 29. Um, just as a heads up, there's a spoiler alert here. I will probably today do some damage to a very popular verse that some of us have liked in Jeremiah 29, 11, but I'm running ahead of myself. Jeremiah 29, I'm reading verse 1. Keep the background we've had in mind. Jeremiah 29, verse 1. And it came to pass the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. So this is the king who's remained behind when the people round one have been taken into captivity. In the fourth year, in the fifth month, that Hananiah, Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet, who was of Gibeon, spoke unto, um, unto them in the house of God, in the presence of the priests and of all the people, saying, Thus speaks God, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, 
I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years, will I bring again into this place all the vessels of God's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. And I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went to Babylon, says the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So please notice a few things there before we skip to another verses. This is somebody speaking, and the Bible does indicate that he's a prophet of God. He's not even called a prophet of Baal, who was a false god at that time, but he's called a prophet of God. He is speaking in God's house, in the presence of God and in the presence of all these people. And he's saying these very reassuring things. He's saying, hey, the exile is going to be over in two years. God is going to come through people. It's going to be over in two years. God is going to bring back our king was taken into captivity. This thing is over in two years. And this is a prophet of God speaking in the name of God, in the very presence of God and reassuring the people. There's a whole interesting story in between that you want to read, but I want to jump to its conclusion in verse, um, so Jeremiah rebukes him, and this is what um, the account says from verse 15, the same chapter, 28 from verse 15. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah, the, the same guy who's prophesied up there, the prophet, hear now Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you but you make the people to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will send you away from off the face of the earth. This year you shall die because you have spoken rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died in the same year in the seventh month. So all that initial bravado speak and very promising speak by Hananiah turns out to have been false. And evidence of it is A, Jeremiah is given confirmation by God and told that guy has not, he's made a lie. And in fact, what he is propagating is nothing more but rebellion, telling the people um, not to engage with their exile experience because God is coming back coming to take them out in two years, they'll be restored. God is telling through Hananiah, God is telling Jeremiah that what Hananiah is in essence teaching is rebellion. It's strange. And I know if you're a rational person at this point, you're feeling like, wow, God is in essence saying this exile experience is permitted and even endorsed by me. And he's so serious about it that he says as evidence that this prophet was lying the prophet dies in the seventh month. In five months from when he made the prophecy, he's dead. Now that's the immediate context for Jeremiah chapter 29. Naturally, 28 comes after 29. So now we can read 29 from verse one, Jeremiah 29 from verse one. Now, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the remnant of the elders of the captivity and the priests and to the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away. Remember we said guys had been taken away in, 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 in batches. And so this is Jeremiah in Jerusalem writing a letter to be sent from Jerusalem to the people in captivity. That would be Daniel, Ezekiel and company. This would be the letter they would be receiving. Um, whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon after the Jeconiah, the king and the queen mother and the eunuchs and the princes of Judah and Jerusalem and the craftsmen and the smiths were um, departed from Jerusalem by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan and a Gerima, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent unto Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying. So listen to the contents of the letter. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all the captivity. This is you and me in captivity being told. Whom I have 
caused to be carried away captive from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build you houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take you wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply, give you the multiply unto you and be not diminished and seek for the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall be your peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets that are in the midst of you and your diviners deceive you, neither hearken ye to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years. Remember this other guy had said in two years. But God is saying, mm -mm, let me get to the record straight. He says, for thus says the Lord God, after 70 years are accomplished for Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace are not of evil to give you hope in your latter end. And you shall call unto me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me when you shall seek for me with all your heart. So let's unpack this very carefully. So first of all, you now almost realize that everything you've heard about, or the majority of stuff you've heard about, the passage of Jeremiah 29, 11, as being God's promise for you is very often read out of context. Jeremiah 29, 11 is God telling people in captivity, you're going to be there for 70 years, but that is still part of my plan for you. I have good thoughts for you. I have good plans for you. And those plans include having you go through an exile experience. That through your exile experience, I'm able to accomplish for you certain things that I was not able to achieve when I had you in your own sequestered culture. But having said all those contexts and read those passages, in Jeremiah 28 and in Jeremiah 29, we notice two other responses to the exile experience. Um, response number one was one of assimilation, being taken whole and getting lost in the culture. But then response number two is a response of alienation. It's a response of alienation, where what the effect of what the false prophet um, Hananiah was preaching was people would end up being in exile, but completely alienated from it. They would be living in Babylon, but they would not function, they would not operate, they would not have children, they would not build homes, they would not, they would not do what it needed to survive and impact that culture. They would want to alienate from it. That would be one of the direct results of this false prophecy of telling guys, guys, hey, don't overinvest here, don't, don't, don't think too much, you'll be out in two years. You want to be, if you're going to be in a place for, um, two years. I have been moving uh, quite a bit last year and this year, and it influences how I pack. It influences what I buy now, because every time I'm buying something now, because I'm not yet thinking permanency, I'm thinking when I want to leave, can I leave this thing easily and it doesn't affect me? Can I afford to give up this piece of furniture or do I really need this? So when Hananiah and his false prophets, and from the look of the letter that Jeremiah writes, he was not the only one. There are many other false dreamers and false teachers and false elders whose net effect of their teaching was one that would lead to alienation from the culture and from the society of the exile. But God has to step in and say, no, 
I know I have a home I want to take you to, and that is back to Israel. But it's going to be 70 years for that to happen. In these 70 years, you will need to leave. You will need to function. You will need to operate. You will need to impact and influence the culture you're living within. And you cannot do that from a position of alienation. And let's just think, let's move away from the walls of old Babylon. And let's come to the walls of digital Babylon or contemporary exile experiences. Don't we, and especially from a religious thrust, end up engaging with an experience of alienation? It comes in very fancy terms. Some want to alienate completely from the culture so that they can be pure. Look at the attitudes we had. Um, some of you are fairly young. In the, in the 90s when radio was big and TV um, was big, there was a lot of sermons and the attitude that demonized media as a whole. And then we began having satellite evangelism and whoa, wait and behold, suddenly we realized that these TVs could become a conduit for the gospel. Then suddenly we began turning down on the evils of radio and the evils of TV. Why? Because we suddenly woke up and realized Wait a minute, these aspects of exile can be used for good. But what had happened in the meantime, because of our many years of staying aloof, of alienating from the TV culture, alienating from the um, radio culture, the media culture, what ended up happening is it was more of the secular thought and more of the secular ideas that had a complete way head start. We hoped we had learned our lessons. And soon internet came along and the same original hostile attitudes we'd had towards media were now taken from media and directed towards the internet. And we demonized internet. We spoke long and eloquent and against it. We even held up, um, we held up gadgets in church and spoke fiercely and ferociously how they were devilish and all of that. And then COVID came. And suddenly every church had to stream and had a YouTube channel and preachers who initially had spoken eloquently anti-internet suddenly began realizing, wait a minute, the only way now I can reach this culture is through Facebook and through YouTube and through Instagram and through Twitter. But again, just as it had happened in the initial media age, our time and period of alienating ourselves from the internet had given secular thought and secular ideas a complete head start in owning that space. And now Facebook, the population on it, is equivalent to the third biggest continent in the world. Yet we are more eager to raise a few millions to go visit a few struggling pastoralists out there rather than thinking about how do we reach the billions who are domiciled on this continent called Facebook. We are keen with our strategies to look for individuals who are struggling here, a struggler here and there, and we are not able to influence the culture significantly. The reason is because many of us, our inability to deal with the tension we are looking at this entire week the tension of being in the world and not in the world leads quite a number of us to alienate from the culture and to alienate from society as a whole in a bid to remain pure. But what that does is, as we withdraw from the culture, as we withdraw from the culture, we become aliens to the culture and the culture becomes alien to us and the end result is we are unable to speak effectively into the culture. You see, if right now I came online and began telling my young friends, hey guys, I'm here chillaxing, uh, they'll be just thinking like, you sound so 90s. It's because culture does not give me a call to tell me chillaxing is such 1990 language. There's a way it talks about it now. Culture didn't call me to tell me LOL is laughing out loudly and everyone understands suddenly what LOL is. 
Culture did not tell me, call me to tell me that we are no longer consuming content in the landscape version. We want it in the vertical version. But culture just changed. Somehow we soon found that people want TikTok vertical content and no longer horizontal content. And so individuals who have withdrawn from the culture in a bid to stay pure from it do not become adequate students of the culture. And as a net result, when they come to try and speak in the culture, the culture cannot connect. The culture cannot understand. And one domain we begin seeing a lot of this is in our seemingly never ending quarrels about music taste and music genre. It seems there are individuals who've withdrawn and believe that you need to sing and sound like you in the 1700s for you to be spiritual. And there's a whole genuine generation born in the 20s, 2000s and, and something who genuinely King James language does not work for them. They just don't understand it, they don't get it. And so this net result of withdrawing from the culture makes us become alienated from the culture. We don't know their struggles. We don't know, we imagine what their struggles is. We don't know what their struggles is because at times loneliness can look like social ability. We may imagine somebody posting all the time is just vain, but what they really are looking for is for something to fill that hole. And if we are not students of that culture because we've completely withdrawn from it, we are not able to adequately interpret it and adequately understand it and then adequately speak into it. And so as a net result, when we come from our withdrawn positions, where we are not studying the culture, where we are not speaking to the culture, where we are not influencing the culture, where we've given the culture a whole playground where they can be able to indoctrinate, influence two for seven. And then we hope that a three hour service, a five hour service on the weekend will be able to undo eight hours daily of bombarding online. And then we hope that somehow we can outdo 40 or 55 hours of them being summonized by Beyonce and Ja Rule and, 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 and Akothe and, and, and whichever other comedian. And, 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 and then we imagine that we will just sprinkle in a 45 minute sermon and a three hour service to undo that. I have news. That's a withdrawal strategy. And it's making us aliens to the culture and culture alien to us, and we are not able to speak to it. Please remember the words of Jesus. He said, go ye therefore into Jerusalem. That's a society, that's a culture. Judea, that's a society, that's a culture, somewhat similar to Jerusalem, but has its own nuance. Samaria, it's a culture very different from the other two and to the rest of the world. So the tools of the gospel that Jesus gave to us in the Great Commission are adequate enough and if well understood, can be able to lead us to a position where rather than withdraw from the culture and we become alien to it and they become alien to us and we're not able to impact them, Jesus is calling us to remember the Great Commission to go into the culture. So choice number one is assimilation. And assimilation happens because individuals have so much access that they are not able to handle well and they therefore become absorbed. The access leads them to just be absorbed by the culture and the society. And the end result is they never become salt or neither become light. And then second response is one of withdrawing from the culture, either to remain pure, either to show your distinctiveness or something, but then the end result of that is you become alien to the culture and the culture becomes alien to you and you're not able to speak into the culture the truth and the light of God and you give the culture room and field day to do as they will to keep indoctrinating at a way and a scale that the initial and occasional attempts you put in cannot be able to undo. And then there's a third and the final response, which is today we're looking at the wrong responses. There's a third and the final response. You notice when we read 
both in Jeremiah 28 and Jeremiah 29, there was the gentleman called Hananiah, the prophet of God. So the way the Jewish society was organized is power was split barely, basically into two. One, there was the king. It wasn't God's original idea, but he permitted it. And then there was always the prophet or the priest. So there was a clergy wing, okay, that held the um, political wing in check. Please notice those words. There was always a clergy wing with the prophets and the priests whose work was to hold the political wing in check. But Hananiah, in his false prophecies, which clearly he did not receive from God, you begin seeing him buying favor. He in his speech, he says, God is going to end the God is going to end the Babylonian rule. God is going to bring back the king. And he's saying this in God's house. He is passing this message to the king. In essence, what we are seeing is the coming together of two powers. Hananiah is probably having difficulty um, accepting that the dominant influence that is going to be there upon the children of Israel is not his Jewish culture, but it is going to be the exile culture of Babylon. And he is trying to appeal to both religious power and to political power to help people get through the season. Or in other words, he is trying to appeal to political power and to religious power to try and bring back an old order where God's values or where if this would be a church, it would be church values were then imposed upon the people. Let me slow down because that probably sounds very eerily familiar. For many years, the Christian church has observed with concern, and they should, and we should, I mean, that there has been a waning influence of Christianity in the culture. Um, church numbers have been dwindling. The um, things that were unthinkable in the past are now completely permissible. And one of the appeals we've seen increasingly, especially in recent years, I come from Kenya, I'm seeing it in my own country. I'm currently living in the United States. I see it um, in the United States. It's just so blatant, has been an appeal, especially by religious power, appealing to use political might to try and bring an order where Christian ideas can be enforced on the masses in response to all these exile challenges. You hear people saying things like, we are a Christian nation, or you hear people saying, we need to bring back the Bible in space X or Z. And what they are appealing to is not an idea of come let us reason together. It's an idea of nothing more than the equivalent of what Islamic caliphates would be. They just, if, if, if there was something like a Christian caliphate, that's really what they are appealing to. Because they feel or they sense that the reasoned appeal of faith has lost its hold upon the hearts. They want to try and make sure it can be enforced by some source of external power other than the power of God. And they therefore either will try and use religious power and in many cases, and political power. In the context of home, you know, we can easily imagine that this is a problem in Congress or a problem in churches. In the, in the context of home, many parents realizing that their children, realizing that they are losing influence over their children and that the exile culture is having more influence on their children than they have, many parents resolve to power also. They guilt trip their children, they try and force religion in rather than model it in. They try and guilt trip their children in. They try and do all manner of gimmicks and emotional things. So they're trying to exercise parental power as a means to force religion upon their children. The end result, we see it in society and would see it also in the Bible time is the entire 
people upon whom such ideas are imposed end up being both aloof and suspicious of any form of authority, including God's authority. Let me repeat. Whereas it seems appealing to try and access political power or parental power or religious power to impose Christian ideas or Bible ideas upon a people to try and reverse or counter the effect of exile thinking, the end result will be this. If people are not going to be one purely on the basis of what God says, come now, let us reason together. Unless the influence of the Holy Spirit is allowed to unfold the truths in the heart of a people, and that can only happen in an environment where people are truly free to choose, including free to choose against God. Unless those circumstances are maintained, any effort to use whichever source of power to enforce religious behavior will end up in a condition where people end up being either aloof, suspicious, or hating any form of power, religious, political, or otherwise. And aren't we there today? This question people are having about fake media is nothing more than an entire generation becoming suspicious of individuals calling themselves media, having that amount of authority or power of our people. The increasing suspicion people have over the church is because in many times the authority and the power has been misused and has become a way to enforce certain doctrine without accountability, without freedom of choice, without freedom. And, and, and instead of appealing to the calm, let us reason and beginning to create an environment where the inquirer can be able to believe and the believer can be able to inquire we have fostered environments that are more performative and where there's more ritual. And the end result is the society looks at religious power with the same suspicion they have with political power, media power, corporate power, because they see the same human flaws in the exercise of religious power that they see in every other space. And the situation is not made any better by people appealing to a power outside of the gospel to try and enforce the gospel, which they then turn around and say the gospel is power. Then the society says, if the gospel is power, why can't it not operate on its own terms? Why does it need to align with republicanism or with democratism for it to be able to go? When we do that as a church, when we do that as a family, when we do that as an individual, we lose something very significant in the sense that republicanism as an idea has flaws and has gaps. They like promoting, for instance, the right to life, but seem to live like once you're born, you're really on your own. Democrats as an idea have gaps. They seem to um, they, 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 they seem to promote freedom of choice, but when it comes to giving people the true authority to choose against them, they seem to struggle with that. And when the church becomes either too Democrat or too Republican, they take upon themselves the baggage of Republicanism, the baggage of democratism, and that is not what God intended in the letter. He writes to the captive people in Jeremiah 29. He tells them, pray for the good of the city. But then he does not say become one with the city. He tells them you need to not become assimilated, but equally, you do not need to begin appealing to political power or to spiritual power to move your own agenda. So in essence, there are three wrong extremes. Extreme number one is the extreme of being assimilated and able to handle the accesses we have. And then the access makes us become one with the culture and we lose our saltiness and our lightness. Extreme number two is the extreme of withdrawing, either to stay pure or to promote our distinctiveness. And this is because we are not able to handle the various um, competing powers, the various competing ideas. And the end result is we become alienated to the culture 
and the culture becomes alien to us and we are not able to speak meaningfully, transformatively into the culture. And the third extreme is one where we then turn to either political power or corporate power or religious power to try and create a place where Christian ideas are forced upon the individuals. The end result being people become turned off, become suspicious, become aloof of all authority, including divine authority. What is the way out? Of course, that's going to be the wider subject of the rest of the week. But immediately, what you can immediately see in the letter that Jeremiah writes, which Daniel must have read, which um, Ezekiel must have come into touch with, God tells his people, instead of distancing yourself from the culture, connect with it. Connection instead of a policy of withdrawal. And why is this important to God? When we read in Jeremiah, when we read in Daniel 1, look at who was being chosen. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar says he wanted young people. He wanted people with ability. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar has an eye to the future. And in the exile, he is putting together a system where the next generation is being purposefully and very intentionally going to be influenced. And in his case, he wants them influenced for Babylon's gain, for the exile culture's gain. And so when God's people disconnect, they lose the opportunity to influence the next generation who the exile culture is all eyes on and trying to look for them. Please also notice that the people, Babylon was a powerful place there. And so not only was Israel the conquered nation, there was also Egypt, there was also Assyria. And so in the king's courtyard, there would not only be Babylonians, there would be Assyrians, there would be Egyptians, there would be Jews. There'd, it was a melting point of cultures. And therefore, in this scenario, cultures that previously Daniel and company could not access while in Israel were now accessible, were now reachable. And therefore, anything that makes them disconnect from culture makes them lose the opportunity to influence and to reach cultures and generations that would otherwise not be able to reach out to. And so because of the potential of the souls that need to be reached, God actually tells the people, you will need to do a tour of duty within your exile for 70 years. You will need to become functional within that space because it is not just your comfort. It is not just your deliverance that I am looking at. I am looking at a bigger picture. If you cooperate with me in this culture, I'm able to influence Assyrians, I'm able to influence Babylonians, I'm able to influence Egyptians, I'm able to influence the whole world. But you are too eager to go back home because you want to go back to the familiar. And now God is telling them, I have sent you there with prophets. I have sent you there with my staff with you. I'm going to give you tools to function within exile. I want you to connect rather than withdraw. And then finally, God tells them, I want you to live your life confronting. And confronting here does not mean protesting, does not mean throwing stones, no. But it means critiquing the culture. It means challenging the culture. So God, one, in his letter, to, in his letter through Jeremiah, he basically tells them, I want you to connect with the culture, not withdraw from it. That is why Daniel and company do not reject the names they are given. They need that kind of name to function within that society. And they know that you can call a rose whatever name, but it will still smell as good. But it is when it came to the question of what to eat, the things that would affect them at their fundamental level, that God now shows himself up in Daniel and company. They were able to connect with the culture on matters of preference, but they were able to confront the culture on matters of principle. Let me repeat that. 
They were able to connect with the culture on matters of preference. What, 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 what's a new fashion to wear? What's a new name I need to be called? What's going to be the new curriculum? What, what are we, those ones we could be able to engage. They're matters of preference. But then when it came to matters of principle, what I'm putting my body, the body, um, God's temple through, what I'm fundamentally inserting in me, what I'm consuming, I'm going to challenge. I'm going to push back. Because when it comes to matters of preference, we swim like the fish. But when it comes to matters of principle, we stand like a rock, yet still being able to show grace and love because we come and operate from a place where our identity is secure and our source of satisfaction is not the external things, but it is in God. And so let me close this evening with this question. Whether you're a mother, father, a young person, a young adult, whether you're retired or just walking into the moan of your teens, whether you listen to this live or whether you listen to it on the recorded version, whether you're considering um, giving your life to Christ and becoming a Christian believer and the whole idea of how to be in the world and not of the world is what's been keeping you back or whether you are a believer who is in this Christian walk and you're struggling with the balance of being in the world and not being in the world. Question to you today is this, what has been your approach? Have you become assimilated with the culture so that your thinking, your principles, your practices are entire like that of the exile? You've been unable to handle the access that you're privileged to get and now it has become the conduit through which you've been assimilated and you're no longer salt or light because you have nothing unique to offer? Or has your approach been one of withdrawal? You've been too scared or too um, not understanding about the toolkit that the gospel gives you to engage meaningfully with the culture. And therefore in your desire to maintain your purity or because you believed your redemption, um, your salvation, your justification with God depends on your distinctiveness. You've basically withdrawn from the culture. And when you wake up, you begin realizing, hey, I'm losing my children, I'm losing my influence, I'm losing my witness because I am alien to this culture and this culture is alien to me. And what's more, the space I have left, the culture has consumed all of it and has filled it with the wrong things. And now you are alienated and God is calling you back to re-engage with it. Or has your approach been um, one of seeking political power, financial power, corporate power, religious power, with the aim not to persuade, but to coerce, enforcing and creating an environment where the will is not given freedom to choose, even against God. And now you begin realizing, wait a minute, the end result of this is people around me hate authority. They hate me when I even begin speaking about spirituality. And it is not because they are, it is not because they are anti-God but it is because the way authority has been demonstrated to them, even including religious authority, of which I have been pressing, ends up being creating a scenario of suspicion rather than conversation. If any of those, God is calling you to something different. It's the Jeremiah letter response. It is the Daniel refusing to eat certain food response. It is the response that connects with the culture on matters of preference, but then challenges the culture when it comes to matters of principle. Are we challenging the culture today or are we accepting everything it's giving us? Or are we too alienated to even challenge it? Or are we too withdrawn to even confront it in a loving way? Are we, are we, have we been too absorbed in it that we cannot demonstrate something alternative to it? Or are we too obsessed in getting power to be able to have our way that we are not able to meaningfully straighten what needs to be straightened? God is calling us to the two C's, connect with the culture on preference, confront the culture on principle. We'll be unpacking more of what that exactly looks like in the rest of the week. But tonight, this is my challenge to you. Will you connect with the culture on preference? Will you confront the culture? on principle. Dear God, please help us 
to stop withdrawing and hence becoming alienated. Please protect us from being assimilated and hence losing our witness. And loving God, help us look to your power and to the tools of grace and not political or any other power. And hence, at the end of the day, we become an authority that is hated than one that is attractive. Show us how to connect on preference and how to confront on principle. And show us how to do this with love and grace so that our dogma does not become obnoxious and our teaching becomes able to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Teach us how to be in the world, but not of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Over Amen. to you. Amen. 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 Um, thank you so much.